Hello, this is David Scher. I'm here for another episode in Physics 572, Introduction to Health Physics. Uh, this is a Zoom session, so I have a few students live. Hopefully, they'll keep us all entertained and make this a lively event. Uh, today, we are talking about internal dosimetry. And I will share my screen that has my slides. I want it to be this one, though. Everybody doing well? You don't have to speak up. It's perfectly fine. I'm trying to make this a gallery so I can see all your shining faces at the same time. Or shining uh, uh, initials for people who don't have pictures. Okay. Um, today we're going to talk about internal dosimetry. Last time we talked about external dosimetry. Uh, uh, and and this builds on that. We talked about. Um, well, I think I've got it on a slide, so let's just go ahead and go. Uh, we talked about effective dose. The effective dose is where we have a weighting factor for the kind of radiation we're working with, and a weighting factor for the kind of tissue that's irradiated. We add up. We we multiply. We, we get our doses to our individual tissues. We multiply for each different kind of radiation. So there might be alpha radiation to the spleen. Uh, and we multiply that by the radi radiation weighting factors for alpha particles. Then there might be beta particles to the uh, spleen. And so we multiply that dose by the radiation weighting factor for beta particles, which is one, et cetera, et cetera. We add up all those for any particular kind of tissue. So we get the effective dose for our for each kind of tissue in the body. And there could be lots of them. Uh, we don't do this by hand, so take heart. You're not going to have to get long sheets of paper to add this all up. This is all done, uh, typically it's done with computers. And, and you'll see that as we go along. Anyway, so then we take the, the doses to the, the effective doses to each tissue and multiply it by a weighting factor for each tissue. And uh, those that are more radiosensitive have a higher weighting factor. Those that are more radio resistant have a lower weighting factor. Then we add that up for the whole body and that gives us the effective dose. Um, so that's what we have for effective dose. Uh, I have to tell you about the older version, the ICRP 26 version, which was called effective dose equivalent. And the only reason I have to tell you that is because the NRC rules are still based on the 1977 re re recommendations. Now, NRC has not updated to the more recent um, uh, rec uh, coefficients and, and factors. In, in the uh, older version, we, instead of the radiation weighting factor, we had a quality factor. The numbers are different, but it's a similar idea. We have the, the dose to a particular uh, um, uh, organ or tissue for a particular kind of radiation. We add up all of the weighting factors or quality factors times our organ doses. All that gives us a dose to a tissue. Multiply that by the weighting factor of the tissue. That gives us the effective dose equivalent. The symbols are different so that we're it's easier for us to keep track of which kind of quantity we're talking about. So when they created this, these new factors um, in, the, in this century, uh, they chose different symbols to make it clear which factors we're working with. In either case, the unit that we use to measure uh, effective dose or effective dose equivalent is the sievert. It's uh, one sievert is one joule per kilogram. It's not a physical quantity because we're multiplying by these uh, factors that were based on judgment, not on uh, any physical measurement. Um, and the traditional units, the old fashioned units are the rem, uh, and one rem is 100 ergs per gram. And it turns out that one rem is equal to one centivert. Uh, okay, so far so good, I hope. 
just reviewed from last time. And these show you how things have evolved over time. These are the quality factor in green or the radiation weighting factors as they have changed uh, over the years. Um, I make a note on here that the NCRP, NCR, NRC rules are linked to ICRP 27. That's so they're still using the old weighting factors, uh, quality factor and, radi and tissue weighting factors. There are fewer of them, uh, but we have to, uh, um, when it comes to rules, the rule is the truth, not the truth isn't the truth. The, the scientifically justifiable uh, explanation is trumped by the legal requirement to use these factors. Okay. Now, we talked about the, so these were applied also to, to external doses. Now we're going to apply them to internal doses. When they were first developed, they were used primarily for internal doses. Now they're used for both. But so, when you have internal uh, radiation doses, radionuclides, the effective dose or the effective dose equivalent remains the measure we're going to use. Um, the doses to individual organs and tissues are gonna be complicated because we got a lot going on and this whole lecture is gonna be show, telling you about the complications. Um, so once you the materials get into the body, either through inhalation or ingestion usually, but there can be other ways, once they're there, um, the radionuclides will move around in the body and eventually settle into a particular tissue. Um, some chemicals are, are uh, go to the bone. Some chemicals are more likely to, to accumulate in the liver. Some are more likely to accumulate in, in the brain or different tissues. And so they will go to wherever they, they go and they will irradiate that tissue that they're in. But they can also irradiate other tissues, particularly for gamma emitters. So uh, material that's lodged in the lung can irradiate the liver or the spleen or, or some other uh, organ too. So it gets to be a little bit complicated uh, in, in this case. And so there's a lot of um, uh, details that, that need to be taken care of. Uh, don't worry about this as much because you won't do this every day. I'm going to explain to you how these, um, uh, how the rate, the, the doses are determined. And then you're going to look it up in a table when you need to use it. And I'm going to show you how you look things up in a table and use it. Uh, it but it's really, it is important that you understand where the numbers in the table come from and what they mean so that you'll be able to apply them. Uh, the other thing is that none of this can be measured, right? I mean, we can see where the doses, where materials, where radiation materials accumulate with um, radiation, with um, uh, position sensitive radiation detectors, but um, we can't uh, physically measure the dose. It's something that's taking place inside an organ, inside your body. We can't, there is no probe we can stick into your body to see what is the actual energy being deposited. So we're completely dependent on modeling and calculations. Okay, there are a lot of factors included in the models that we need to use to, to get to the dose. One is, uh, one set of factors are gonna be metabolic or kinetic data, where the, or the particular nuclides go to in your body, how fast they go there, what fractions go to which area. I hope this will become clear as we see some examples. We're going to need radiological decay data. So how much energy is being emitted per unit time. That's going to have a big impact on how much energy is deposited. Remember that radiation dose is energy absorbed per unit mass. And we're going to have to uh, come up with radiation transport models and parameters. So what, what radiation transport means is if a gamma ray is emitted at one point in the body, how much of it makes it to other organs? How much of it makes it from your lung to your liver or from your lung to your spleen or whatever um, organs you're, uh, pairs of organs you're concerned about? And so there are complicated uh, models necessary for that. Now, a radiation dose is energy absorbed per unit mass. So we're going to need to know the mass of the particular tissue that we're interested in. Remember, at the root, we're, we're going to calculate tissue doses 
Then I'm going to weigh them by uh, um, weighting factors. So but we're going to do this on a per um, uh, organ basis or, or different kind of. Uh, we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to uh, do the calculations on an organ by organ basis. So for anyone who just joined us, um, we're doing internal dosimetry. We use the same factors we did uh, before for external dosimetry, radiation weighting factors, tissue weighting factors. It's a little complicated because once the materials are in the body, they can uh, one organ can irradiate another, and so we have to take that into account. And to do that, we have to use computer models. that We can't measure this stuff. And what you see on the screen are factors related to the models. Um, uh, so I've mentioned all the ones in the left, uh, tissue and organ. Um, on the right, uh, the models will have to uh, will have make a difference what, what the route of exposure is. If it's breathed in, then it's going to go through the lungs, and the, the way it's absorbed and distributed will be different than if it's ingested by mouth. And so uh, that's a, a factor that... Um, uh, is important. Um, if it's injected directly into the bloodstream, that's going to change the amount of material that's going to be distributed to different organs. Um, one factor that's going to remain a parameter in our models is the intake. How much you took in will affect your dose. Um, so if you eat 10 becquerels, it's going to be um, uh, a tenth of the dose you would get if you had 100 becquerels. Now, as I mentioned before, all of these models are going to lead to tables that will be dose coefficients. We get our dose by, by multiplying the intake, the, the amount that's taken in by air or by, by mouth, by some conversion factor. Okay, um, so that's going to be a factor. Now, there's some concepts we need to have that will be important for the model. One is the notion of the intake is the amount you take into the body, the amount of activity you breathe in or the amount of activity you, you ingest. That's the intake. Now, that once you take that in, that material is transferred to the blood and, and however much fraction gets transferred to the blood and body fluids, that's called the uptake. It will be some fraction of the intake. Um, some materials are more soluble and they'll be easier to pass to the uh, blood. Some will be insoluble and will either remain in the lungs or will be passed through the um, intestinal tract. Now, after the material is, there's an intake and after it's uptake, there's an uptake into the blood, there's deposition, which is when this material is transferred to the organs or tissues in the body. So these are uh, terms that we're going to use. I just want to lay them out here so that they're very clear. And then at the bottom left, I have this famous quote from George Box. He was a, a famous uh, st statistician. Uh, he made the, I think, insightful observation that all models are wrong. Some are useful. Now, no model, the reason it's a model is because it's not the real thing. So no model completely <clears throat> and, and in uh, complete detail uh, depicts the the whatever it's describing. You have to leave, make it simple. You have to simplify real life and leave some things out. You have to make assumptions and approximations. Um, and so he is correct that all models are wrong. Nothing uh, is meticulously uh, reflects reality. But many models produce results that are useful for a purpose. So in our case, we're going to get results that will be a good index or a, a, a good approximation of the radiation dose with sufficient accuracy so that we can protect people from injury. Okay, um, I'm going to show you a very simple model. Uh, and this uh, in this model, I, I, I said there are many factors. One is the kinetic data and, and, and the other is radiological data. This is gonna be a one compartmental model showing you the kinetics how it works with a one compartment model, simplest model possible. In this case, we have a certain amount of material. There's an intake, a certain amount of material is taken in. It's uh, uh, metabolized in the body. A certain amount is going to be decay, undergo radioactive decay, and a certain amount will be eliminated 
by metal metabolical pro metabolic processes. Okay, just one one compartment. Um, and so um, there's a single. We're modeling this as a single intake. We're going to look at hydrogen three or tritium as water. So this is tritiated water we're, we're depicting. When water goes into the body, it goes throughout the entire body. It, it doesn't concentrate in a particular organ. So the a conversion from intake to uptake, what, whatever amount of water you drink in, that's going to be absorbed into your body. So the uptake fraction, the, the fraction that, uh, of uptake is one. So the uptake is equal to the intake. The tissue we're concerned with is the whole body. Um, and in addition, the uptake is the deposition. The, the amount of material that gets into the, the, the circulation is going to be uh, the amount that's deposited in all the tissues. There's no uh, preferential absorption into one tissue or another. Okay, so our uptake is going to be whatever we ingested. So let's do some math. I love math, so I'm going to do it. You won't have to do this math, but if, so what we've got is our simple model. The activity that's here, there's um, uh, two paths by which it decreases, the biological decay rate and the physical decay rate. That's why lambda P is physical decay, lambda B is biological clearance. So I can rearrange terms and, and put these two together. And so I, I, I have what looks like our, uh, right here, it looks just like our radioactive decay equation, but it has got a new parameter, lambda E, that's the sum of the biological constant and the physical constant, okay? Um, so there are two paths that are carrying material out of the body in parallel at the same time. And so the kinetics of this is that the, uh, the, the, the material is being eliminated uh, uh, at a rate that's equal to the sum of those two constants. This is called the effective decay constant, biological decay constant, physical decay constant. In terms of half-lives, the effective half-life is the product of the physical half-life and the biological half-life um, divided by the sum of the two. Um, let me get my little uh, marker here and show you my whiteboard. And essentially what we're saying is this. Is that visible to everybody? The invert, one over the effective half-life is equal to one over the physical half-life plus one over the biological half-life. The re and, and I just did some math on the slide to put it in a different form. It's the product divided by the sum. It shouldn't be a surprise that this is the case because the, the effective half-life is um, uh, ln2 over e is lambda uh, is lambda e. So the lambdas are related to the half-lives in this way. So if I put all these ones and multiply by log, natural log of two, all these become lambda E become this, lambda E is equal to lambda P plus lambda B, which is what I've got on my slide. So they're saying the same thing. This is saying the same thing as this. It's just a mathematical um, ver um, rewriting of it. Now, whenever you have an equation that is uh, dA dt is equal to minus lambda A, that's going to end up being a, an exponential. And so that's what I have on the bottom of the slide. These become, an, this one compartment model becomes an exponential function. And so once you take in the, 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 the material enters your body, the tritium enters your body, it decays away at a rate that's equal to the, the, uh, the sum of the biological elimination, basically sweat, urine, et cetera, plus the physical decay. 
That's what it looks like in this simple model. Other models are more complicated. Now, this idea of an effective half-life and a biological elimination half-life, clearance life, clearance rate, is an important one that, that shows up a lot in health physics. So I copied here a website that gave me some uh, parameters of different isotopes and what their biological clearances, physical half-lives, and effective half-lives are. So I want to make a few observations. Look at the top left, tritium. The physical half-life, and these are in days, is very long compared to the biological half-life. When one half-life is very long, the effective half-life is equal to the short one. Okay? So in the first two cases, the physical half-life is very long. The effective half-life is equal to the biological half-life. Oh, I should put a light on myself. And the inverse is true. So uh, calcium-45 has a very long biological half-life. That's the calcium in your bones. Your body doesn't like to, to turn that over. So it stays put. The effective half-life is about equal to the physical half-life. So which when one is much, much shorter than the other, the effective half-life is equal to the shorter one. Okay, if you look through here, that's the case in, in all these situations. Now, when they are of comparable size, the effective half-life will be shorter than either of one of the others. So if I've got, for example, zinc 65, 244-day physical half-life, 933-day biological half-life, the effective half-life is shorter than both. Same thing for rubidium-86, 19-day physical half-life, 45-day biological half-life. The effective half-life is shorter than both. It's not between the two. It's always shorter than both of them. Okay? And if you think about it, it makes sense because uh, it's already decaying, uh, being eliminated by at some rate by one of the processes, and the other process is taking more of it away. So it's going to clear it away faster. Is this confusing or clear? Uh, being uh, clarifying? Okay, wonderful. Yeah, but you've seen this before. Okay. Um, so now we talked about the kinetics, right? That was the first part of our model. Now I'm going to go to our simple model and look at the decay data. That's also an important part. This uh, figure on the right side comes from the HPS website. We've used it a few times before. It should be familiar. I'm using tritium because it's a very simple decay process. I don't have to do all the stuff we did before with the fraction for each uh, decay mode and the energy of each decay mode. It's all very simple. The frequency is one or the, the number of decays. Uh, the, the frequency of, of this particular decay mode is one and the energy is this. So the energy per decay is 5.7 keV. I'm using MeV units because that's my conversion factor is that so 0 .000, 0 .0057, um MeV and the yield per decay is one. All energy uh, this is both decay and radiation transport model. These are very uh, soft betas. they're not, one organ isn't irradiating another. For beta particles, all the energy is assumed to be absorbed in the organ. So I don't have to worry about all that complicated transportation, uh, transport model is very easy. I don't have one organ irradiating the other. And yet besides, the critical organ here is the whole body. There's nothing else to irradiate. Another factor we needed was the tissue mass, the so-called standard person uh, that is a model of an average person is 70 kilograms. Um, I, I will tell you that I there may be two standard men in me, but that's uh, life. Um, so that's going to be important. So the dose is the energy divided by the mass. So let's see. 
the K here is a constant that converts from MeV to joules, MeV per gram to joules per kilogram. We did that in a previous slide. This is the, the one is the yield. The energy is 5.7 times, that, that's the fraction of each decay that's by the, that goes by this route. 5.7 times 10 to the minus three is the energy. And seven times 10 to the fourth grams is the mass. Um, and so all that, the dose rate is all that multiplied by the activity rate. Whatever that activity is going on over time, that gives us the dose rate at any particular moment in time. Now, when we work with internal dosimetry, we don't really calculate the dose rate. Uh, we can, there's nothing wrong with doing it, but it's just not how this process is used. Instead, we talk about the committed dose. So suppose I uh, uh, ingest some tritium today. Yeah, here I go. I got to drink some, some tritium in water. I feel like the governor of Ohio uh, at, at that train derailment drinking the contaminated water telling you how, how uh, it doesn't hurt me. Um, so I've taken this material in. It's going to be here for a while, circulating in my body and all that. I'm going to be eliminating. It's going to be decaying. But let's say it's not water. Let's say it's something that has a longer residence time. Let's say it's radium that stays in your bones for a long, long time, like that calcium did. Um, I'm going to get dosed today. I'm going to get dosed tomorrow. I'm going to get dosed the whole year, I'm going to get dosed next year, I'm going to get dosed the year after that, I'm going to dose a decade from now, right? Now, if I'm trying to keep track of this because of some regulation or something like that, then every year I'm going to have to look back in the records and see what are all the, the other previous years that they had material to intakes that I have to add in there to make sure they didn't exceed a limit this year. So we don't do that. That would be too complicated. We're going to do a, a, an accounting trick. So when I get this exposure today, all my future doses are going to count for right now. We're going to calculate what my dose is going to be for the rest of my life, and we're going to count that in this year's dose limit. Okay? So this is called the committed dose. Because I have that stuff in my body, it's now committed that I'm going to be getting this dose for, for my life, and we count it all against today. I think of it, I, I think I said last time that the I, I view the um, quality factor and the tissue weighting factor as a uh, accounting mechanism so we can account for all the radiation risks with a single number. The same is true for committed dose. This is just a way of accounting for things uh, that, that uh, makes it uh, more straightforward to, to, uh, for regulators. Now, when we talk about occupational exposure, we use a time horizon of 50 years. So we use the 50-year committed dose when we're talking about workers. And the next video is going to be about work, occupational doses. When we calculate doses to the member of the general public, the time horizon is 70 years. So we have to do our calculations on the basis of 70 years for, for environmental sorts of concerns where the public might be exposed. The symbol we use for the 50-year committed dose, we put a sub-50 for the effective dose equivalent here. This is the old symbol, right? This isn't E. This is the, the old H that the NRC uses. It's the same formula that we had before, right? We had this formula, and we had some... Uh, act, um, uh, function of time, I'm going to integrate that over 50 years, whatever that function of time is over 50 years. In this case, the function of time was an exponential right here. So I put that into my integral for 50 years, and I turn the crank, or I go to um, uh, Mathematica or something else, some, some, look it up on a table, I find out what this integral is, and this is what it is. This A0 is the initial intake, how much I ingested on day one. There it is right there. Okay? So this is just a number, and when this is 50 years, and the effective half-life uh, half uh, half was 
50 days. I don't know what it was. It was a very short period of time. This exponential goes to zero. It's many, many, many half-lives. So that's all zero. So it turns out that my 50-year committed dose is I multiply these numbers together. Now it's got a, when I do the integral, I get a one over lambda E, that effective half-life. It shows up in the denominator when I do the integral. That happens with exponentials. Okay, so that is, and I turn that crank, I, I put that in my calculator, and it turns out I get 1.7 times 10 to the minus 11th times A0. That's my committed dose for 50 years. Now look at this. I've got a, a dose for 50 years that's proportional to the intake. I can just divide this 50-year commitment by the initial intake, and I've got a factor that I can get the dose for any amount, I could put in any value of, of A0. I have a, a, a um, 10 Becquerel intake, I can get the dose for that. Uh, 50 Becquerel intake, I can get the dose for that. These are what's called, what used to be called dose conversion factors. Now they're called dose coefficients. And that's what we're going to use. I told you at the beginning that there are tables with this. This is going to be in a table. And that's how we're going to... Um, get our doses in the future. We're not going to do integrals and we're not going to look up uh, transfer coefficients or you know clearance coefficients and effective half-lives. It's an important concept. Sometimes you can do simple calculations with it, but we're just going to look it up in a table from now on. So um, that yeah, it's a dose coefficient. In this case, it's for ingestion. Remember, the route of exposure was important. Uh, and that's the number we get. And the number I had here was because of the conversion factor. This was sieverts per Becquerel. Whatever my activity is in Becquerel, I multiply it to times this coefficient, and that gives me the dose in sieverts. Okay. Now these tables, just what I did has been done thousands of times. So the guy who wrote our the, the book that you might be using. Um, uh, Staben, Michael Staben, he was a big guy in, in producing these tables. He's an internal dosimetry guy in nuclear medicine. Um, his mentor, uh, Keith Eckerman, was one of the original guys who did all these calculations back in the 70s. Um, so your book, the book, if you're using that book, you've got somebody who knows a whole lot about this particular topic, um, one of the world's uh, leading experts in it. Um, there are different tables for ingestion, for inhalation, and submersion. So let me explain just very briefly what submersion is. Um, and so if you're in a cloud of a noble gas, that's not going to be accumulating in your body. It's, it's not going to contribute to internal dose instead that entire cloud all the radiation being emitted by that cloud is giving you an external exposure and so that's what submersion dose is there's a table that we're going to find in the rules about submersion doses i just want you to get an idea of what that is the tables have coefficients for individual tissues and organs you're going to see and there's going to be a, a table uh, or the, uh, the table will also tell me the effective dose, where they multiplied in all the weighting factors and added it all up. The tables are available in uh, these sieverts, but they're also in uh, rem per microcurie or something like that. Those are available. Okay, now I gave you a very simple example with tritium. I'm going to go through and show you some more factors that apply to other situations, okay? Um, and this one has got to do with radiation transport. Remember I, I said all the, the radiation for the beta emitter is emitted locally, but th that's not always the case. So in here's some examples of organs that have radioactive material in them. They might irradiate other neighborhood organs, particularly neighboring organs, particularly if it's a gamma emitting isotope. So this is iodine-131. It preferentially locates in the thyroid. 
uh, and it's a not retained anywhere else. It's more or less eliminated quickly from the body. The fraction is not um, uh, taken up in the thyroid. Um, so here's an example. Let's say there's a, a, the liver. Uh, this is FDG. So this is um, a sugar. Um, uh, the, it's taken up. It appears to be the liver. It appears to be the heart. It appears to be the bladder. It appears to be the brain. Those are the ones that see, appear to have that sugar concentrates in. Well, this liver and uh, these other organs can irradiate neighboring organs, the kidneys, the uh, you know, um, thyroid, etc. And so somebody has gone to a lot of trouble to do calculations of if I have uh, activity of, of a certain energy in my heart, how much does that irradiate the lungs? How much does that irradiate the spleen? All those calculations. And one of those somebodies is Mike Staven. So the symbol that's used for that, uh, we talk about source organs and target organs. Source organs are where the material is concentrated. Target organs are where the radiation might go to. And so there's a, a symbol called this, a uh, concept called the specific um, effective energy from the, the source organ to the target organ. How much energy is transferred from the source organ to the target organ? And it's important to remember that th there's also a situation where the source is the target organ, where there's self-irradiation. And that's almost always the highest radiation dose is when the, the, we consider the case where the uh, tissue that has the material in it also is uh, uh, what the dose is to, the, to that same organ. Now, the formula for the SCE is right here. So we have a bunch of different, each nuclei that might be in your spleen or your liver or whatever could have multiple uh, radiations emitted by it, right? We've seen that before. So the SCE is we add up for all the different radiations for that isotope the yield, the, the fraction per, how many uh, quanta of radiation per decay times the energy of that particular radiation times this phi for that particular radiation and the radiation weighting factor. If it's an alpha, then it's going to be 20. If it's a, 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 a photon, it's going to be one. And all that's divided by the mass of the target organ, not of the source organ. Where this SEE is going to tell us what the dose to the lung is from material in the liver. So when we get what the dose to the lung, we have to divide by the mass of the lung. It's a little bit confusing sometimes, but that's what. It, but this is what the SEE is. And yes, sir, I see someone raised his hand. Um, yeah, I didn't get what SEE stood for. I heard specific, specific and energy. Effective energy, I think it is. I, I, That'll yeah. do. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so these phi i, that's where all the real work is, is in these phi. And the phi i are um, calculations of how much radiation is uh, deposited in the target organ from the source organ. These are all calculated based on computer models. Uh, and in the computer models, this is a, a, one of the very early phantom, uh, computational phantoms that was used on the left. It's a very stylized version of the human body, but th the geometry is really easy to calculate with, right? I can tell, you know, I, I don't have to, I can, I can know the bounds of my um, uh, do loop pretty easily with these very simple geometries. Um, and computers were not so fast, so people had to use uh, a simplified version. These are the, the original MERD phantoms. MERD stands for Medical um, Internal Radiation Dose. It was the name of a committee that developed this techni uh, technique or, or did these initial calculations. This is the MERD phantom. Um, and this is a stylized version of what it looked like. This is the exterior the skin, and these are the inter, the inner um, organs. Um, recently, they're using, on the right, we have uh, a, a phantom 
that's derived from CT data of actual humans. And so now they do these calculations, not with, they segment these uh, CT scans and, and somebody marks it and says, this is the lung, this is the spleen, this is the thyroid. And they, they identify all those tissues, those uh, organs in the CT data. And then they use the CT data to get the, the material and the, the distances between the sources and targets. So it's gonna be more realistic. Truth be told, it doesn't make very much difference in terms of uh, the numbers. This is a pretty good estimate, particularly when you think that I, they're going to take, we're gonna take these dose coefficients that we, we figure out here, and we're gonna apply them to people who don't look anything like this. We're gonna apply them to 70 kilogram people, and we're gonna apply them to much bigger people as well. And we're not gonna make corrections for that. So for radiation protection purposes, if we have one digit of accuracy, that's probably gonna accomplish the, the protective goals we're seeking. We do not end up with, with individualized uh, um, calculations for each person. In medicine, sometimes they do. So for example, if they're injecting a person with a, a therapeutic uh, a drug, um, they take that person's CT scan or that person's spec scan, and they use it to build a model so they can get the actual dose that that person will receive for their, their organs. Uh, that's called, that computer name, program is called, named Olinda. And it's Mike Staven's program. Okay, um, so you can see they've got more realistic over time. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about uh, kinetics. I did a, a very simple model before that was one uh, compartment. This is a, a, a relatively simple model as well. This is for iodine-131, or for any iodine, really. The iodine enters into the blood because of an uptake. Could be an uh, injection, could be an inhalation, could be uh, injection, uh, in ingestion. Um, some of it goes to the, uh, it go, the... The interesting part is when that goes to the blood. It's going to do so pretty quickly. Whether it's injected, it goes right away. If it's inhaled or if it's um, uh, ingested, the, the absorption rate is very, very fast. So it goes into the bloodstream almost immediately. Now, from the blood, it, a, a per, certain fraction goes to the thyroid. It's about 30%. The rest of it goes to your, the, the rest of the body. Some is eliminated from the thyroid to the rest of the body. And from there, it's eliminated from, from the body by uh, either urine or feces. Now, what I'm trying to show you here uh, with all this data that's on here is there are, um, let's see, one, two, three, four. There are a bunch of lambdas here, right? There are a bunch of, of uh, differential equations, <laughs> one for the blood, one for the thyroid, one for the rest of the body, and the, the equations are a little bit more complicated. This is just a three compartment model, and we've already got all these equations. This is a, a kinetic model for uh, that's that's used for this is that, the, the I believe for um, inhalation. So we've got. Oh, this is ingest, ingest. This is all ingestion and inhalation. So we we start with an ingestion or with an inhalation. Goes to the respiratory tract. We have a, a gastrointestinal tract model that's going to have all kinds of components. I'll show you that in a minute. We have a lung model. It, there's a, the body fluid. That some of it's going to the liver. Some of it's going to the lymph nodes. Uh, some of it's going to the skin and being and removed by sweat. Some by urine. Some by pee. it's very complicated. Lots of transfer or, uh, organs. Um, uh, transfer uh, coefficients, et cetera. We're just going to stick with the uh, tables. We're not going to go get into this mishigas, uh, but it's important to know that there's a lot of information that's hidden in that little table. Uh, you can you can uh, uh, take it from me. You can whatever. The idea I'm trying to convey is that there's a lot of science. These are not just numbers thrown down. There's a lot of work that goes on to, to do this. Okay, so uh, anybody have any questions about these uh, um, uh, this metabolic model? I can go into any details anybody wants to know about. 
Seeing no questions, I'm going to move on. Um, so there are different routes of intake. The kinetics of uh, inhalation are very different than the kinetics of ingestion. And so there are tables that apply, that apply to each one separately. Um, just an observation from, from my perspective, ingestion is most useful and most uh, frequently used, I think, for environmental purposes. So when you have a, an environmental release, then uh, material might be discharged to the water. And so people might drink the water and uh, have a, an uptake because of that. Uh, the, if, if material is released into the air, it uh, material can fall out onto um, crops. People can eat. The, so at uh, Fukushima, um, there was a lot of airborne activity. Some of it precipitated onto to crops. People may eat those crops, and so you can calculate the dose from using these techniques. It's not very common that people ingest radioactive material at work. At work, the most important route of exposure is inhalation. Now, I will tell you that there was a quite a kerfuffle in oh, about 1990, 89, 88, something like that. There was a, a postdoc at a Northeastern University that uh, uh, uses three letters for its name. Two of them are similar to ours, but it has a different first name, maybe a different state, maybe beginning with an M, I don't know. Um, anyway, this postdoc uh, announced that he thought that he had been, uh, he did have an uptake of P32. And, and he believes someone was spiking his lunch to produce this. And so this was a big kerfuffle. I don't know what came of it. I don't know that anybody was ever identified, um, uh, but you can go on the, on the internet and look in um, the NRC's uh, document um, repository and you'll find reports about this um, uh, intake of P32. That's the only example I can think of where there'd be a significant uh, oral intake of radio, uh, radioactive material at work. I don't know if anybody here has any um, examples that they want to care to share. If so, uh, you're, you're welcome to, but it's m much more common to have airborne radioactivity present a hazard at work. The third route, injection, is very common in medical applications. It's not so common at work, but when it happens at work, it's a big deal. So if somebody punctures their hand with radioactive material, it, it, it raises concerns at many levels. And if this is plutonium or something else that's relatively toxic, it raises even more concerns, and that has happened. Um, it happens, I, I understand it happens maybe a handful of times, maybe six times a year or something like that, where there'll be these kinds of injuries uh, across the country. Not with plutonium, but that's a one-off. So um, now let's talk about examples of oral intake that did occur, uh, have, have occurred. One is radium dial painters. Has anybody... As I think everybody may have heard of this, but I'll talk about it briefly because I know we have some new people to the program. Um, so in the 19, the early part of the 20th century, uh, when radium was discovered, one of the things they recognized is that when radium is mixed with a, a fluorescent paint, uh, paint with a material that's got phosphor in it, the energy from the radium will cause the paint to glow. The radium itself is not the reactivity. You don't see the gamma particles. That's not what's glowing. The gamma particles are exciting nearby atoms, and that's what's causing the glowing. Okay. But the, so the, uh, uh, um, a little industry developed using this naturally occurring radioactive material that they would paint this uh, 
radium spiked paint onto watch dolls so they would glow in the dark or instruments that uh, you, you, you need to see in the dark. Um, and this was a, a pretty big industry, a relatively big industry. Uh, it, eventually it, it occurred in three locations in New Jersey, not far from uh, uh, New York, in Ottawa, Illinois, not far, it's a, a little bit west of Chicago, and later in Waterbury, Connecticut. Now, what the, one of the work practices that was developed there is they wanted to have very fine lines when they drew on the watch face. And so they would tip their, their paintbrush in their mouth to get a very fine point as they were doing it. Like when you want to um, thread a needle, often you'll wet the, the thread so that it holds together and then you can get it through the needle, right? Anybody done that? Or am I the only one here? Well, that's essentially what they were doing. And when they were doing this, they were transferring very small uh, quantities of radioactive material. They were ingesting very small quantities of the radium. This caused some very serious injuries and illnesses, uh, became a, a, a quite a scandal, and, and became a, a cause celeb. I think I showed you uh, photographs of Evan Byers, right, who, had, who was a, a sportsman and a big socialite. And he had was drinking radium, so he was also uh, uh, um, that was a, a thought to be a, a, a health thing. I, don't, I can't believe it was a thing, but it was. Um, but they were ingesting this radioactive material, and they developed very serious uh, illnesses of their jaws. Uh, teeth would fall out. They some of them developed very large tumors. Uh, it was a very uh, sad thing, and and. Um, some of them developed, had uh, very um, unfortunate consequences. Another one I want to mention is up to, and so there was a huge research project done at Argonne, which isn't that far from Illinois Tech, um, that, uh, uh, where they brought in cohorts of these people, did whole body counts of the radio that they had, and they were able to, this is one of the sources of information about the effects of alpha particle radiation was from the, the radium dial painters. Uh, I actually grew up in Ottawa, Illinois. And if you go there, there's a statue to honor the, the um, what they call the radium girls, the dial painters um, uh, recently. And about, I don't know, in um, maybe 1989 or so, uh, they excavated a lot of soil from Ottawa because it was higher in, in you know, they had used some of this material as fill throughout the town. So the, the uh, EPA then came in and, and excavated the soil uh, to re restore it to the natural rate uh, background. Another uh, important case that's more recent that you may recall is Alexander Litvinenko. He was a Russian living in London. He suddenly became ill on November 1st, 2006. He died 22 days later from multiple organ failure. Um, because the IAEA sampled his hair and they believed that he had been poisoned with polonium-210. After he died, they did an autopsy and confirmed that um, he had in fact, an, did in fact have an uptake of polonium-210 uh, based on the activities that they measured and the amount of time between the onset of illness and his death. Uh, they believe it was about 1.5 gigabecquerel, maybe 400 millicuries. That's a lot of material of polonium-210. Polonium-210 is an alpha emitter. Um, it has a fairly short half-life, so it's a pretty high activity. Um, the physical half-life is 138 days. Biological half-life is 50 days. And based on the formula we showed, we learned before, the effective half-life is about 38 days. Now, of the amount that you ingest orally, about a tenth of it is is the uptake. Remember, we had the uptake and the so the, the uptake into the system is about a tenth. That helps that that fits into figuring out the fifteen gigabecquerel. Um, and the the distribution parameters about thirty percent ends up ends up in the liver, ten percent in the kidneys, ten percent in the spleen. 4% in the red bone marrow. That's probably the most important factor here. And 40% uh, in other tissue. 
Uh, that doesn't actually add up, but that's fine. Um, I'm just copying these from another source. So the dose of the red marrow based on 4%, 10% was, was uh, taken up from the uh, ingestion amount and 4% of that goes to the bone marrow. Bone marrow has a fairly small mass. So the dose to it was 50 gray over those 22 days that he survived. 20, 50 gray is, uh, well, it's 5,000 rem. And remember that 400 rem was the amount for the GI syndrome, right? 800 rem or so for the, I mean, the hematopoietic syndrome, 800 rem for the, the GI syndrome or 600 rem for the GI syndrome and 10, uh, uh, 1,000, uh, 10,000 rem uh, for the CNS syndrome. So he died of acute radiation syndrome because he had a, a pretty high, light, large dose to many of his organs. Now, I'm going to move on to talk about um, uh, inhalation. Those are examples of ingestion pathway. And, and um, now we're going to talk about inhalation. So in the inhalation model, the particle size is important. And the, uh, the clearance rate is important. So the particle size is important because the way your respiratory tract works, if you have very large particles, they, they get stopped in your nose and throat. So when you're in a dusty environment, your nose begins to run, but that those particles don't make it all the way down into your, deep into your lungs. So those are dust is a very large particle. They get trapped in the upper airway. Um, smaller particles go deeper into the lungs. And those are going to affect the, the way this... Um, the uh, kinetic model works, the biodistribution model. So here is an example of one of these lung models. Remember I told you before, we had this model that shows all these things. And it says here, we have the respiratory tract. Inside that box that says respiratory tract is this model right here. So this is the nasopharynx. This is the, just the, the nose and, and, and mouth throat. Um, part of it goes to the body fluids. Part of it goes into your lungs. I mean, you're, you're into your intestines. It gets swept down. Like when you have a, a lot of mucus, it ends up being transported into your stomach and, and passed through. Um, and so that fraction is right here on this table. It's 0.5. The part that goes into the body fluids is 0.5. And the biological half-life that occurs at is 0.01 in days, pretty quickly. Part, smaller particles go to the tra tracheal bronchial, the upper respiratory tract further down. Uh, and that is um, also has two compartments, body fluid and lungs. In that case, 95% goes to the body fluid, 5% goes to the, to the uh, GI tract. Okay. Further on down is the lungs, the P for pulmonary compartment, E and F. Those are 80% goes to the body fluids. And a portion of it, there's cilia, cilia in your um, respiratory tree, little, little fingers uh, on your cells. It pushes the, the mucus and the, 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 the stuff up into your upper respiratory tract so it can be eliminated. So that's what this arrow is. Um, and there are other models that go to lymph nodes in the um, uh, in the area and they get they get trapped the material gets trapped there. Um, okay, but this is just to show you the, some of the complexities that go on. Now there are three different classes of material and there are fractions that differ for each one. I just want to make that uh, uh, clear to you. The, these classes are going to, I'm going to talk about in the next slide, I believe. Um, in fact, let's, let's go to it. So there are three classes of, of, of chemicals that, that they um, identify. D is for day, W for week, Y is for year. That's the residence time in the lungs, how long it takes to clear the lungs. Things that are cleared within a day are D class. Things that are cleared within a week are W class. 
things that take a year to clear out are Y class. Um, okay, so, um, and there are, yeah, so 5% of the material is cleared uh, in, a, in a given period of time. That's the definition of the Y class. Now, more recent versions of this, an ICRP 60 and ICRP 103, instead talk about F, M, and S fast, moderate, and slow clearance rates. And these are defined in terms of the fraction that's that's cleared away within 10 minutes. So F class material, 100% is cleared within 10 minutes. For M class, 10% uh, is cleared within 10 minutes. For S class, 0.1% is cleared within 10 minutes. Okay. So these are going to figure into our dosimetry. And when we look at those tables, this is important to us because it's not just part of the calculation. When we look at those tables, it's going to tell us, here's the dose coefficient for class D, here's the dose coefficient for class W, here's the dose coefficient for class Y, okay? In the other tables, it's gonna say, here's the dose coefficient for F or M or S. We're gonna look at those tables in a bit. Okay, um, the, the, yeah. So these materials also, some of it's gone to the uh, respiratory tract, uh, the digestive tract and being eliminated. And I told you that before. Um, and it's, like I said, it's important for the coefficients we're gonna be able to look up. Okay. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. Um, so when it comes to determining the pathways and the fractions of which goes where, yep. is that just experimentally determined based on right. the thesis process or i think it's it's uh i believe they depend on animal models there's mm -hmm. a lot of work done with with experimental animals to see how it clears away etc i don't think it's based necessarily well to some extent it might be based on um, whole body counting of workers who've been exposed accidentally but i think that's a very small group by comparison i think the more systematic way they do it is uh, with animals Uh, that doesn't belong there. So um, here is uh, a, a place where you get these, these tables, these coefficients. This is one source. It's a book published by the EPA. You can see it on the screen. You don't need to see it in the camera because it's right there. Um, this These uh, dose coefficients, and it's the old name of dose conversion factors. Now we call them dose coefficients. Um, these are based on the old 10 CFR 27 or 26 and NCR, ICRP, I mean, ICRP 26 and ICRP 30 methodology. ICRP 30 is the internal dosimetry calculations that were done using the ICRP 26 coefficients, the tissue weighting factors, radiation weighting factors. Um, ICRP 30 itself is probably it's many volumes. Some of the volumes are two inches thick. It's a very large compendium of information for ICRP 30. It's very exhaustive. A lot of work went into it. And uh, it, uh, um, unfortunately, those are the old coefficients. But not unfortunate for us, if we, if we live under the NRC, we are stuck using the old uh, coefficients because the tissue weighting factors are part of the, the apply or part of the, in the regulations, are the old titulating factors. The, the quality factor is the old quality factor. All those were used in calculating these numbers in this old book, and we are required to use them even though there's more scientifically accurate information. I'm giving you a link here so that you can get your own copy of this uh, if you wanna uh, spend time looking up dose, uh, doses from these coefficients, and maybe you'll have to. Here's an example showing the uh, dose coefficients or dose conversion factors for ingestion, okay? So there are tables that look like this. As I said, these are all the organs that were um, had separate tissue weighting factors in the ICRP uh, 30 system. And then there's the F fact, F1 is the uptake fraction, how much goes to the bloodstream, from your intestines. And then the effective dose is over here. That's the weighted sum. 
Now you'll notice in here that there are a, there's a, set, a bold number for each line, right? On the first line, it's effective. On this line, it's uh, um, this is the bold line, the bolded. Here, this is the uh, the bold one. Uh, and when it says remainder, the, the that's the lower large intestine wall. That's the limiting organ. This will get you to 50 uh, rem for that organ faster than you get to five rem for the whole body for the effective dose. We have two different limits. We're going to get to uh, those uh, occupational stuff in the next video if we have a next video because it's getting kind of late. Um, but uh, the the um, uh, the bold one is the one that reaches the regulatory limit first. So I've got another slide here that includes iodine. In the case of somebody's got a question. So is the tracer is I don't know. So it's like a tracer duplied, right? It's the first thing that you monitor to monitor that yeah. you're in regulation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. This so for iodine. It's preferentially absorbed in the thyroid. There is dose to other organs, both from the thyroid and from the when it's flushing through to begin with. But in every case, thyroid, in almost every case, thyroid is the limiting factor. You get 50 rem of thyroid at a lower uh, activity than you would get 5 rem of effective dose. That's what the bold one is. And that's what I have for the first video. Any questions right now? Let's take a few minutes and I'm gonna start another. I Yeah, I did record this. I'm going to um, uh, stop this. Uh, well, that way I can go to another video so it won't be so long. I, I'm gonna to try to be as quick as I can in the next one. Uh, and so if, you, if you'd like to come back, we've got the, the second uh, link available uh, in the email. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, how do I stop recording? Oh, there we go.